So what I will say is, okay, great. Okay, I just want to say hello to everyone online. Uh, we're live streaming, so hi there. Um, what I will do today is I'm going to go through, um, give you a little bit of insight into my life as a wildlife photographer. Um, and then I'm going to go through some photography fundamentals that I generally keep in mind while shooting wildlife that I hopefully, uh, you know, can be some inspiration for you guys. So I don't know if you're into wildlife photography or not, but there's certainly fundamentals that can be applied to any kind of photography as well, especially moving subjects, uh, but in general as well. Uh, and then the other thing is I will do a Q&A at the end, but I will definitely take questions as we go. So if, uh, if I'm going along, please just uh, put your hand up and, and we'll discuss it uh, as needed because I know you can um, think of something at the time and then you know, by the end you forget or maybe it's more relevant if it's happening uh, as, we, as we go through. So feel free to bring the questions. Alrighty, so I'm just going to quickly pop through a couple of images just to give you an idea. Um, can I get an indication of who's into wildlife or animal photography already? Nice. Okay. Awesome. Good. All right. So there's a few things I'm going to touch on and then I'm also going to go through um, equipment choices uh, more towards the end of it. Okay. So the first thing really, and this is relevant for any kind of photography, is knowing your gear. Um, it's especially prevalent with wildlife or any kind of animal photography where your subject is constantly moving, it's not going to wait around for you, you can't pose it or repeat the situation. So that's where, you know, being able to change settings, really understanding your gear on the go is really, really important. And that only comes with practice. So um, one of the things that I found when I was learning is to really focus on understanding one component at a time and then move on to the next thing because you know photography and the technical side of it can be very overwhelming uh, especially if you start changing things but you don't fully understand you know what you're changing uh, and how it's affecting other settings so for example you know you might want to focus on learning aperture and completely thoroughly understanding what aperture means, uh, if you're changing your aperture, what that is actually going to do, and then move on to something else like shutter speed and then ISO, and then you know you have your whole uh, exposure triangle set so that you know once you start moving things around how it's going to affect the other, and you can start to predict that. Uh, with wildlife photography, obviously field craft is uh, very important, especially from a safety aspect. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you some uh, interesting photos on that <laughs> soon. Um, but really, about getting compelling images is understanding animal behavior. So not only is it about understanding your camera and the technical side of things, but you need to understand your subject as well, or at least have you know, some, some understanding. That also only comes with practice and getting out there and doing it. But that's going to then allow you to be able to predict behavior of an animal so that you're ready to capture that shot. Uh, really, really important. And with wildlife photography, one of the things we often say is, you know, have everything ready and then hurry up and wait because majority of our job is waiting around. Um, and also to give you a little more insight into my background, um, so I've been shooting professionally as, a, as an animal photographer for coming into my 14th year now. Um, and I started off, I actually started with reptiles um, in Australia. Reptiles are kind of a big, big thing there, well, for some people. Um, so I actually had pet reptiles and then I started photographing them as a hobby. And I was working as a graphic designer and art director uh, for almost nine years. And uh, I started just taking photos on the weekend and, and doing it as a hobby. And I quickly found that I enjoyed it far more and it just became an overwhelming passion. The passion for wildlife, though, has always been there. And that's the primary focus for me is, is the animal and the topic. So the photography part did come later. Um, and then after a few years, it kind of progressed and I eventually 
kind of made the leap into photography full time and left the, the graphic design behind. But I definitely have a strong influence of, of that design background in my images and um, hopefully I can portray that uh, soon once I give you some image examples. Um, yeah, so just once I started to do it full time, it's kind of a niche industry, so it's really hard to make a full time living out of. And I was actually doing it professionally for about 10 years before I started doing anything um, close to related to National Geographic and working with them. And that's, it is kind of one of the pinnacles as a wildlife photographer, um, but it's not, it's not something that happens, you know, generally quickly. I mean, I was, like I said, shooting 10 years professionally as my, as my full-time living before those kind of opportunities came up. And so I used to actually have a pet photography business in Australia for about seven years. And that's a really excellent way um, of honing your craft from moving subjects. So that way you have a little bit, of, a little bit more leverage of I don't want to necessarily say manipulating your subject, but you kind of understand what I mean. You can have treats and squeakies and things like that. I used to have a squeaky attached to my camera and I would literally just put it above and give it a squeak and then the, you know, the dog would do the head tilt and the ears and everything and it would be like perfect. Can't quite do that with a leopard, um, but it definitely helps in getting you used to um, shooting uh, topics that are constantly moving around. So that's something that I, I understand, obviously, if you live in the city, that your access to wildlife isn't going to necessarily be as often. Um, there's definitely plenty of things to, to photograph. And, you know, one of the things uh, that is quite prevalent is that if you can nail bird photography, then you're pretty much set because that's that's actually pretty hard. So there's plenty of pigeons and stuff around that you can practice on because once you get that, um, then actually quite a lot of other stuff is going to be is going to be kind of easy. Um, so don't feel like just because you're not going out on safari or you're you know out in some wilderness that you can't practice and hone that skill. Practice on um, you know whatever you have access to, whatever you're seeing, and also the shooting of moving subjects is relevant for say if you you're doing toddlers or young kids that are constantly moving around and not you know staying in the one position and posing for you as well so i think you know there's some things that you can apply to a few different genres of photography the main thing though is uh, i usually say in any workshops that i do um, is the three p's of photography and for wildlife especially it's practice and that's relevant to knowing your gear. Patience is the waiting around. Um, you need to have plenty of it. And I hope that if you're interested in wildlife photography, then you already are interested in the subject. So the patience part hopefully kind of comes naturally because you should want to be there anyway, whether you're, you know, you're taking pictures or not. Hopefully you're there to enjoy the animal in the moment as well. Um, but perseverance is definitely the one that kind of pushes past the patience aspect. Uh, and that can be relevant in quite a few ways, um, especially with uh, shooting in really tough conditions or for a really long time. Uh, in my field of work, filming, I film wildlife documentaries, uh, and I do a lot of filming more so now these days than I do still shots, but it's relevant for both, and that is there's there's a lot of times where you can go out for hours, days, weeks, where you might have something in mind that you specifically have to capture or that you just want to capture, um, that you really need to then have that perseverance to stay committed to trying to get that. But probably the most important thing is passion. And I think that's where it makes these other three uh, points kind of easy part of it because if you're passionate about your topic doesn't have to be animals but if you're passionate about it then everything else should you know you should want to be there you should want to be learning more and spending time with that topic and subject so I think that's uh, that's probably one of the most important aspects to keep up your motivation because it can be extremely frustrating at times um, but definitely it makes it worthwhile if, if that's something that you're you're passionate about 
So some of the challenges, uh, and this is probably where the perseverance comes in as well. Um, there's, there's been quite a, a few challenges that I've had over the years. And to be honest, in 14 years of what I have had, um, it's not too bad, really, uh, considering the situations that I'm in. Um, there are, there's been some, some dicey situations. Um, the one on here, this is a, I was mauled by a cheetah and it was completely my fault and my own complacency that that happened uh, and a big wake up call for me. So I don't, I, I wanna have a disclaimer as well. I don't wanna turn anyone off wildlife photography or Africa specifically where I've had, where I spend most of my time and have picked up a lot of things along the way. Um, and I just wanna say, please do go on safari because it is completely safe and it's amazing and you will not regret it. Um, for me, I'm in a lot of situations where it's all day, every day, year after year, and I'm in a lot of situations that visitors or tourists are not allowed to have access to. So, and staying in conditions that you probably wouldn't want to stay in. <laughs> so uh, please don't, don't worry too much about it. Um, but I have had, this one's quite interesting. I picked up um, a worm parasite in uh, Madagascar. And so that was burrowing through my leg. And so I had to have that one uh, burnt out. And then the middle, actually it wasn't too long ago, um, I was medevaced out of the Masai Mara in Kenya um, where I, I collapsed of a few things, but uh, especially exhaustion um, from working for just going one country to the next, job to the next, picking up things along the way, just getting sick and not being able to get over it, but pushing through too much. Uh, and it all kind of came to a head right at the beginning of a really important shoot, I might add. And uh, so that was uh, a little bit frustrating. But the main point being that for me, I, I look at these these situations that I've had and it's completely worth it like I'm constantly appreciative that I get to do what I do and yes it's very physically demanding it's it's difficult um, shooting in extreme conditions arctic where uh, at this point I can't feel my fingers anymore um, to you know shooting in the rain or in the deserts i've just come back from uh, this was shot last week so i was in the jungles of borneo filming um where it's extremely hot uh, i was staying on a very not this boat a, a bigger boat than this um but really kind of dodgy in terms of how they were preparing our food and washing it in river water and um, i'm really surprised none of us are violently ill right now um but the content that we got was incredible and uh, that will come out before the end of the year so um, uh, I'll be sharing that on my social channel so hopefully it was worth it I, I think it is but um, again like it doesn't have to apply to wildlife photography I think if you're passionate about whatever subject that you want to photograph that's where this just becomes part of that journey to getting the images and the content that you want and producing um, producing images that that feel like it's worthwhile for you. Um, this one is, is a good example. You know, if it's raining, certainly as a wildlife photographer, that doesn't mean that we stop shooting. We, we put a rain cover on and it actually turns out quite worth it. So for me, this was actually a really sudden downpour. I'm just lucky that I had a rain cover with me because um, I didn't have it on initially and it just started, I was photographing elephants and it just started pouring down. So we kind of all ran into cover. Um, I work with my husband a lot, who's also a National Geographic cinematographer, uh, Russell M McLaughlin, in case any of you follow on Instagram. Um, and so we rushed into cover and literally just out of the corner of my eye, I could see this leopard tortoise running across. So I was able to put my gear on, run out into the water, uh, into the rain. And, uh, and get this guy here. So you can see he's just running past there. So yeah, definitely worthwhile. Don't pack up the gear if, uh, if the conditions seem like they're starting to get challenging. And the other thing too is you don't have to have, you know, all this high-end professional gear. You can have rain covers that are 
um, you know, the, almost those disposable ones or like the little plastic ones, just keep a few of those in your bag all the time because that's where you're gonna start getting some really interesting stuff. Uh, so Komodo dragons are one of the pinnacles for me to see and photograph in the wild. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm a huge reptile fan. So to see these guys was the ultimate for me. Um, they're basically dinosaurs uh, and they're the largest lizard in the world, if you didn't know. Um, and that's in Indonesia. So I've just come back from there. But these photos I did uh, about four years ago when I first went there. And so I wanted to get, I got normal long lens shots, which is giving me, you know, a safe distance, obviously, and a very sort of compressed look to the images. But I wanted to capture something that was, um, you know, a bit more intimate, more of an environmental portrait. But I'm also not, I, I'm happy to get close to them. And that was, that was fine. I've just been filming them now where I've literally been on a tripod and you, you'll see footage at the end of the year where they've literally come up to the camera and they're licking the camera. So I'm kind of like trying to pull focus because in filming we always uh, focus manually, constantly, not uh, auto. So I'm kind of like trying to pull focus and then I'll take my hand away <laughs> and then I'll try to adjust it again. And then it was just too close. And so I had one guy on either side and they basically have these sticks there that kind of fork out at the end. And then if it gets too close then they kind of just guide it away, like off. So then, I have these sticks coming in into my shots. I'm like, no. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we have some nice footage of that that will come out soon. But for this one, I've basically just taken a boom pole, which is um, usually what you'd have uh, like audio on the end of. Um, I've got some wheels off like a toy vehicle, big sort of all-terrain toy vehicle. And I've just put a, a base plate on there and I've got a remote trigger on it. So you can see in my hand here. So I'm just rolling it in and out and then I'm just shooting as I go. And these dragons were actually very relaxed and very chilled. Um, the beauty of putting something close into them is that they're very curious. So it means that they were licking a lot. So I have a lot of shots where their tongue is coming out. They're inspecting the, the gear. Um, no one bit anything. I did actually use gear that I had um, that I was willing to lose if I really had to, um, to get the shot, but it was perfectly fine. Um, and you can see they're quite notorious for their, they're kind of well known for their saliva. So um, I could go into that. Uh, there's been a few discoveries about actually, you know, the bacteria and venom, everyone thinks you get bitten by it and you just die. Um, but I won't go into a biology lesson today. But you can see definitely when they see something interesting, they do start salivating. Um, so that's what he was kind of there doing. And they really look at you like your food. Um, and they, they're, they're very confident animals. They look at you like they know how, how strong and how big they are and that they don't have to prove it. But if they really wanted to kind of take you, they could. But literally just dripping with saliva there. Okay, so I'm going to go on to some photography fundamentals and these are things that I keep in mind um, every time while I'm shooting. And so as a starter, composition is really a really important one. So like I've said here, especially for a strong image, composition is very, very important. But you know, when you're filming or photographing something that's uh, very dynamic, something that's constantly moving, it can be easy to focus solely on that topic and actually forget to look at your whole frame. So just remember to really look at everything. Look at the background in relation to the subject. Make sure you're framing. Um, that might mean moving slightly to get distracting objects out of the way or just don't put everything in the middle all the time. You know, start playing with composition and moving things around. Um, I like to take a variety of shots and I'll touch on that in a second. But when, when first starting out, if you're unsure of what's going to make a strong composition, then I definitely recommend shooting a little bit wider to begin with. And then once you download your shots afterwards, start playing with some cropping options and you'll quickly start to understand 
what really works to make a strong image. And then that's going to progress into why you're out shooting. You're going to look through your frame and you're going to see immediately what is strong and what works for you. So that's a really good way if you're unsure to start with how to, uh, to have a play and practice with that. So yeah, you'll start to learn very quickly as you see it what's, what's going to make for a great image. The other thing too is I really like to work with zoom lenses. And there are a lot of really excellent prime lenses, especially telephoto, that um, are quite popular with wildlife photography. However, I'm kind of a small person, and if I'm shooting all day, every day, I cannot hold a 600mm prime up handheld and, and actually work. I'm gonna, I just physically can't do it. So, um, I also am often in situations where I'm limited of where I can move around and how much I can move around. So that's where a zoom for me really excels because I want to be able to get a variety of shots and I might be stuck in a vehicle. I might be in a game vehicle or I might be stuck on a boat uh, where I can't physically move in and out to change my composition or I can't you know, move around. So with a zoom, then at least I know that I can get depending on obviously your proximity and, and the focal length, but then you can get some environmental shots, wider shots. Uh, you can start moving in and get some more intimate stuff and then perhaps move in more uh, and with your zoom obviously, not physically, um, and get some detail shots. So something to really keep in mind, don't take a gazillion photos of the exact same picture all the time. Just get a few safe shots off if you want um, and then start mixing things up a little bit. So, you know, maybe just take five or ten shots until you're happy with one set way and then after that really start, to, you know, changing things up a little bit, mix it up. Um, and the beauty of digital is it's not going to cost you anything to take a few more pictures. So if they're throwaways, that's fine, but it's a great way to um, really get some variety in your work and also tell a bit more of a story, especially um, not everything has to be in wildlife a tight shot. It's nice to sometimes show environmental shots where people then can get a sense of where they are, a sense of place. Negative space is a really big one for me and I think this is where my, my graphic design background comes in. I was used to working with other people's images and I needed to be able to lay them out. I had to make sure that, um, you know, in the days of magazine spreads that uh, I wasn't going to have anything important on a seam, that I had room for copy space and, and text and that kind of thing. So that's definitely a mindset that I, I still have. But even if the end use of your images is not commercial or editorial or, or anything like that, it can still really lend strength to an image. Um, it can create some tension uh, in an image for you depending on where you place things. So you'll also notice that with these, if I have an animal that's facing in, I will frame it in a way that the animal is looking into that frame. So while I do want to highlight that there are rules, you know, composition rules, rules of thirds and all that kind of stuff, and I definitely keep those in mind, it's also a creative outlet, so really there are no rules. Experiment and play, I mean, that's really the key. It is a creative um, outlet for you to, to experiment with. But I generally, if I have an animal that's looking a certain way, I will always give it somewhere to look into in that frame. So obviously the Oryx here, I want it to be able to look in, same with the bird. And what, what I tend to do is, um, once I, especially with a static subject, um, I will lock focus and then if they're looking different ways, I'm constantly reframing to make sure I'm taking the shot where they are looking into that frame. Um, and another thing too, and especially prevalent with negative space, is keep it simple. I, my kind of work is very much about, I like minimalist, uh, very simple images, clean, um, strong colour, that's really my, my style of work. Another really important one is perspective. So this is more so assuming that you do have the ability to move around a little bit. 
So, you know, if you're out photographing a potentially dangerous animal and you're stuck in a vehicle, you know, your chance of moving around and changing your perspective is kind of limited, but there are definitely situations where you can. And this is a prime example. So this uh, chameleon, this is the exact same chameleon in the same spot on the same tree. And the only thing that's changed is where I'm standing in relation to that animal. Um, and you can also see that he gets progressively uh, annoyed with me <laughs> as I'm moving around. Um, so I've, it's given me quite a, a variety of shots. So basically, uh, I've actually started off on this one where he's nice and bright and light. Uh, and you can see I've just gone exactly uh, perpendicular to where he is on the branch. And then I've gone to this one where I've then moved around. So then you can see the angle there. So when I'm looking through the frame, I can see, you know, this background here and, and you'll be able to tell with my work, I like to shoot very shallow. I like to separate my subject. I like simple backgrounds if I can, working with bokeh, nice creamy, uh, soft backgrounds. So once I've started to move around, I've noticed that there's actually a yellow bush behind where he was. So then I was able to fill the frame with that. And as I moved around even more, then I've gone to uh, a green background and then actually on the other side I could get the, the bush that he was physically on then in the back. So it's given me a really nice uh, variety of images where, where you know, I've, I really all I've had to do is actually take notice of what my background is looking like and move around accordingly. So definitely uh, something to keep in mind. Be really aware of what's happening in your frame and your background. Probably one of the, the keys I feel like to wildlife photography is get as low as possible. Um, you know, I spend most of my time in the dirt basically on the ground if I, if I can, like if it's safe. Um, so if I took, you know, if I'm working with an animal that I can physically get on, on the ground with and it's um, smaller, I'm going to try and get to eye level or even lower if I can. Um, if I'm stuck, with, uh, stuck in a vehicle, so if I'm in Africa, usually that's an open vehicle and the lowest that I can go is going to be the, the door rim or railing there, then that's what I'll, I'll do. I'll try to utilise sort of whatever I can at the time. If I can physically get on the ground, then that's what I'll do. And if I had have shot this image in particular from standing or even if I was crouching and still quite above it, it's going to be far less interesting because I'm basically just looking down at the snake. I'm not really seeing its face. I'm seeing kind of the top of its head. And all I'm really going to see is dirt behind it. I don't get a sense of place or environment. Whereas if I get down really, really low, I'm down at that animal's level, I'm seeing the world from their perspective, I'm then able to give insight for the viewers of that world as well. And also now you can actually see part of its environment and, and it also lends itself better to the style of shooting that I like to do, which is that shallow kind of style. Because as soon as I start to get lower, all the perspectives are exaggerated, so then you know, my backgrounds are really then going to blow out nicely and, you know, blur. Another one is uh, eye contact. So definitely, see, this is the reaction. I always get the, a little bit of audible uh, reaction to these pictures. And that's exactly why. Um, you know, if I take a series of shots and I need to, to pick one out because they're quite similar, I'm always going to go for the eye contact image because that's really going to connect deeper with the viewer than, than if it's looking away. Uh, I will definitely do a variety of shots and you know, eye contact isn't always you know, relevant or necessary for every shot and you might not get that. But if you do, then I really think uh, if you can wait around and, and put that perseverance into, into place where you actually hang around a bit longer and you can get that moment, it's definitely worth it, for sure. So action is a big one, especially for wildlife photography. You know, you want to capture things that are moving and while it's happening and that kind of stuff. So uh, the Safaka uh, in Madagascar, they're very known for doing this, uh, this particular action. It's like they're dancing. 
And the reason that they do that is because their hips are designed in a way that they're, they're tree dwellers. Um, but their hips are designed that they can't actually walk forward like a lot of other primates and monkeys. So when they actually do want to get down on the ground and get to another tree or a different area, they have to kind of scoot along sideways. It's very, very cute. And going to Madagascar, this is definitely one of the shots that I wanted to get. So the great thing with where this happened in particular is that you can see it's a dirt road. Um, so there's quite a big gap. So I was actually able to position myself. Again, I'm quite low on the ground. Um, and when this safaka came down from the tree, I was able to lock focus on him like over here and then track him as he went and take a series of images before then he's gone off into the, uh, into the side. Yeah. How do you keep the focus in when he's tracking. So for this kind of thing, um, I will use, uh, so I'm on Nikon, so I'm going to use continuous uh, focus, I think on Canon at Servo AI. Um, and depending on the subject, the lighting, that kind of thing, will de determine how many focus points that I'm going to utilize. So sometimes, this was quite dark. Um, it doesn't really look like it, but there's a lot of tree cover. So this was only at uh, 500th of a second. It wasn't super high speed shutter. So for that reason, a um, little bit darker, sometimes your, you know, your camera can lag. So that's where your middle focus point is always gonna be the quickest and most sensitive. So I've just chosen one focus point instead of letting the camera kind of choose wherever, um, which I do do sometimes. Um, so I've literally just found the middle focus point and I've done my best to keep that on the subject as I've tracked along. And so that, you know, the camera is constantly, the great thing was he was pretty parallel to me. He wasn't sort of coming forward, but that tracking system will keep track if it's coming towards you or going away from you. Um, yeah. So there's a, on the Nikon that I shoot on, which is the D800s, um, I can choose how many focal points I want to work with. So I could also choose middle point as the main one, but then allow it to utilize the ones around it if it picks up that there's uh, more contrast there. Uh, and that can work really, really nicely as well. And then if I'm shooting something moving in an environment that's not too busy, that I have plenty of light and contrast, um, then you can potentially um, use where it's utilizing any focus point in the frame and it will do a really great job of, of tracking that. But if you have, um, and this actually isn't too bad because there's not a lot happening on the road here. If there were like bushes in front and that kind of thing, um, utilizing the whole field of focus points is just gonna choose the closest thing to you all the time. So it's actually probably gonna struggle, you know, it'll hit that and then something in the foreground and then that. So that's where I would especially use a single point focus and really make sure it pinpoints exactly where I want to keep so track. the center of the picture, but then you crop it? Uh, no, so I don't crop it, but as it's, uh, as it's moving along, you'll notice that actually there's sometimes a bit of lag and then that's where those points around, once I've locked on, it can see that it, it's within this region and it keeps track of focus, yeah. So you can utilize, can utilize single point. I know on my Nikon there's 9.21.52 point. Um, there's 3D tracking, which is actually really quite good as well because it will lock onto, um, you know, assuming that it, it can do a good job and the light and everything's there. That can move all around frame or quite often I'm shooting in a situation where not only the subject's moving, but I'm physically moving. If I'm shooting from a zodiac, like a boat, and it's like, we're going like this, and then the polar bear's like walking along, you know, it's really tough trying to get that, uh, that combination of working. So that's where your, your continuous focus is really, really key. Yeah. Um, if you know that your subject is going to stay on the same focal plane, you could still use a static focus. And, and lock it in, and then, and then it comes down to what your aperture you're shooting, how much leverage you have in terms of how much depth of field you've got to work with. Because I like to shoot shallow, if I have you know, even fairly slight uh, movement out of that focal plane, it's gonna be out of focus. So I generally like to track uh, as I'm going, for sure, yeah. So 
like I say there, the middle focus point is definitely going to be, especially if you're starting to go into low light situations or anything where there's not a lot of contrast between your subject and your background, that's where it can be really, really handy. Um, I also shoot a back button focus all the time, so I'll always separate out my focus to my shutter button, because um, that way, whether I'm using continuous focus or static, I lock that in and I can take shots and release the shutter and not have to find focus again. It either keeps locking on if I'm in continuous, or if it's in static, I'm locked on and that's it. Um, and that's really handy if there's, you know, I've got an animal and then it goes behind a tree and I want to get it right after it's coming out. I don't have to waste time missing the shot trying to find focus again after that. Or if it's through grass or bushes, once I've actually found focus and locked it, I don't care about those bushes anymore. I can let them be out of focus and it can be a really nice part of the image. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously with the action, um, if you want to freeze it, then a higher shutter speed is obviously uh, kind of key to that. Because I shoot shallow, so for me, um, aperture is my absolute priority at all times. I, that's the one key thing that I want to decide on because that's deciding the creative look of my image. So like I said, I shoot shallow. So I'll often shoot at 2.8 or f4. Um, depending on the lens and what it's uh, capable of. Um, I use the, my main go-to wildlife lens is the, the Tamron 150 to 600, which is a minimum aperture of f5, so I'll always start at that point. If I'm fully extended to 600, then it goes up to 6.3, um, which, you know, when I first got the lens, I kind of think that's, that's high for me of how I would normally shoot. But once you combine that with the compression that comes with 600 millimeters, you actually still get really nice separation. So this is uh, the 150 to 600. And majority of the images that I'm showing today are shot with that lens. And it, it gives me that, that look and separation that I really want uh, with that. So um, the benefit of shooting shallow, not only do I get that creative decision and I separate out my subject, is that that then automatically couples me with a high shutter speed um, because I'm not trying to go such a high aperture which then I have to somehow compromise with my ISO or my shutter. I'm obviously as a general rule want to keep my ISO low because I want that crisp image. Um, so for me aperture is always the decision that is made first. I'll try to keep my ISO low and then the shutter speed um, generally as long as it's high enough that I feel it's going to freeze the action that I want, then I don't care what it is. As long as it doesn't go below what I feel like it's going to give me a, a sharp image. And that varies depending on the situation. Um, for example, with a cheetah fruit, I would usually not want to go below a thousandth of a second, maybe higher if I could. And same with bird photography. Generally, I'm going to start at one thousandth of a second um, as a bare minimum uh, so that I can freeze it in. Because I'm shooting uh, shallow, generally I'm going to have a much higher than that. If I've got a nice sunny day, then I'm getting much, much higher than that anyway. So it's not really my concern after that. But in a situation like this where it's, you can see the background, it's dusk, the sun has already dropped, I have a high speed animal, um, I then have to find a compromise. Uh, I've got my aperture as low as I possibly can in this situation. Um, and I've actually had to shoot uh, from memory uh, 500th of a second as well, maybe 800, I'm not sure, which is kind of what I would consider low for a cheetah running, uh, especially chasing at full speed. Uh, but it actually has done enough for me to, to get the shot. So the reason that I haven't gone higher is because my ISO was at about 3200 and I didn't want to push you know, higher than that. Otherwise, I'm starting to work with an image that I probably you know, wouldn't kind of consider as usable for me uh, on an ISO perspective. So it's about, especially about finding that balance, but generally um, I don't think about shutter speed first as a, as a primary goal. Because I know a lot of people, um, you know, can have that as a priority because, you know, you're dealing with a moving subject, so you kind of think, well, shutter has to be the first thing. And then they have, you know, you have no control necessarily over what your aperture has to be in finding your exposure. And then you 
potentially lose consistency to the look and feel of your images. And that's for me what is the primary concern, is that, that creative look and feel. How many lenses do I carry on a trip? It varies. Um, quite often I, I have a harness and so I'll always have two camera bodies attached. Um, most of the time I'll have the 150 to 600 on one and then it depends on the situation and potentially the animal uh, as to what I have on the other. So quite often that'll be 70 to 200 or I might have um, a wider lens um, if I feel like there's going to be some opportunity for some, you know, environmental or landscape shots. Um, if I'm shooting in something that's in an area that's very picturesque, then that's what I'm probably going to, to go with. Um, yeah, that's... If I'm in a vehicle, then I take a, a fair bit more because I can take a bag, so I'll have a few options with me. Generally, I'll always work with two camera bodies, and that's so that um, you know I'm changing lenses at the absolute minimum. I don't want to be doing that out in the environment, you know, too much. Um, but in saying that, I, admittedly, I'm I'm not precious with my gear at all. I'm I'm out there to do a job and get it done. So if I need to change a lens, and you know that's fine, I'll do it. Um, the main thing of having two camera bodies is for speed, not missing the moment of that time spent changing that lens. So I'm certainly less concerned about you know getting any dust in there as I am to missing the shot completely. Yeah. Uh, so. On the other end of actually wanting to shoot sharp uh, and freeze action is then using intentional blur and I really like to utilize this and it's a really great way of if you get to a point where the light has faded so if you you know if you're at uh, dusk or even dawn and it hasn't really come to full strength yet um, that doesn't mean that you you can't shoot if you don't have the opportunity to use a high shutter speed you know, you don't want to put your ISO up, you know, too far. Have a play with, uh, with a slow shutter speed and do some intentional blur. And like I mentioned before, we're shooting digital, so it's not costing you anything. Take those shots, you know, delete them if, uh, if they don't work out. Um, the thing that I do is with intentional blur, I don't wait till I'm in a position where I have to use it, where I don't have much light. Um, I like to be able to do that at any time, depending on the situation. So this is middle of the day um, for these, uh, the wildebeest migration. Um, I wanted to give a sense of movement and busyness and like the rush that is happening. So to do that and to get, I've actually gone down to one eighth of a, a second there and then panned as I've shot. So I'm emphasizing uh, that motion blur for the background especially and I'm trying to pan with that main subject at the time. Um, and you can play with all different shutter speeds. Um, that's the beauty of digital as well. You get immediate feedback. So you can test out you know, some settings. You can look at the screen. Do you want it to go slower or faster? Yeah. The one you took at 1A, is yes. there something that you planned that you knew you wanted to do? Yeah. Or were you just sitting there and just decided to do it? Oh, no, I was just sitting there. Um, I, I don't plan out shots all that often just because in this, in this industry with this subject matter you can go in with set um, some you know, concepts of what you want to get but I'm so used to having to work dynamically um, that I can't you know, plan too much other than know my equipment and kind of see what happens there and then you know, utilise the... So I've taken some some shots where I've frozen the action and to be honest uh, I didn't feel like they were really that great so that's where I've started to have a play around on the spot yeah there are some that I I go into and think okay I definitely want to get some intentional blur today I'm gonna do that at some point but most of the time I, I work pretty much on the fly yeah um, so you can also go up a bit higher this uh, shot um, I took uh, like a week and a half ago um, in the Arctic and I didn't want to have the bird fully blurred so I've played with a few different shutter speeds um, so I've landed at 200th of a second and that was you know with panning with the bird I was able to keep the 
the bulk of the bird in focus uh, and sharp, but then knowing that the wings are obviously going a lot faster than that, uh, then I'm able to get some wing blur, which just creates a little bit more interest to the image. Um, and it's also because I'm panning with that bird, I'm gonna get that, uh, that blurring in the background, which I really like. Uh, so not only is it out of focus, but I'm getting motion blur as well, which creates a little bit uh, more interest, something just a bit different. Um, and I've already done my sharp shots. I've got those out of the way. Um, so that's where I'm starting to, to play with my settings a little bit more. And then, you know, what ends up happening is I like this image a lot more than I, you know, my standard just sharp ones. So the way, especially if you're in bright light, the way to be able to still utilize a slow shutter speed. So what I'll do is, this is basically where it goes the opposite of how I normally shoot. I will put my aperture up to the absolute highest that the lens can possibly do. So uh, that was uh, f22 for for this. I think that was on the 150 to 600. So f22 I think is the maximum. And then I've put my ISO down to the absolute lowest that it's capable of. Um, so for my camera, it goes a few, um, a few stops below ISO 100, so I think it actually goes down to 25. Um, and then I've just played with until I've got an exposure that I like. And then once I've got a shutter speed where the exposure is fine, then I work back. Is that giving me the kind of blur that I want? Like, is it too blurry? So not blurry enough? And then I start working with that and I can adjust the other settings as needed to get the exposure right. Yeah. So quite relevant to what I was saying before with, especially, you know, if it was raining, the leopard tortoise shot, that turned out to be one of my favorite and it was just one of those things that happened. I was lucky I had my rain cover with me. Um, don't stop shooting if the light is not perfect, you know, if things seem to be challenging, keep shooting and uh, silhouettes are a really great way of, of doing that as well once you start to lose light. If um, you know, it's getting to the end of the day or it's really early morning and you are in a situation that you can have a lot of light behind your subject, again, by getting down lower, that's where you're gonna notice that things start to fall away that are distracting in your image and you can certainly get more sky in your shot. Um, then intentionally underexpose your shot to really bring out you know, colors in the background. Um, and the other thing that I've actually done here, this is, uh, this is a, a frame that I've pulled out of footage. It's actually a filming that I did, um, but exactly the same principle with my settings. So it wasn't, it wasn't this golden yet, uh, but I could see the sky was really like interesting and ominous. I was uh, in a vehicle shooting from, actually for shooting from the roof of a vehicle, um, but because the vehicle was quite low on a hill, I still had that really nice low perspective. And um, so what I've done here is not only have I underexposed my image intentionally to bring out some detail and color in the background, but I've manipulated my white balance as well. So I've gone to 10,000 K and I've made it as absolutely yellowy, golden, warm as I possibly can so that it enhanced that, uh, that really kind of sunset look. Um, so white balance isn't really something that I'm, I'm gonna touch on today, but it's definitely a really important part um, of the creative process as well. So I generally shoot on, on a custom Kelvin setting and so Kelvins are how uh, color temperature is measured um, so the lower the number the cooler more blue the color is the higher the number um, the warmer sort of orange it's going to be so that's something where you'll notice if you're shooting on a daylight setting if you move over to like a shady setting or a cloudy setting you'll notice that everything's a bit warmer, a bit yellower, and that's because it's trying to counteract for kind of the blue shade that comes in if you're in the shadow of a building or in, you know, under cloud cover and that kind of thing. So it's trying to compensate for that to give you, you know, a proper white balance. But you can manipulate those to, to give them a look and a feel, you know, a more um, emotive feel to, to your images. So the baboon shot, 
was actually really early in the morning. So I've gone the other way around. I didn't have any any oranges or yellows or anything to work with. It was literally just a very cool sky. So by underexposing, I'm able to enhance that more. If I exposed to show detail on the actual baboon, then that sky would have been completely blown out. It wasn't a situation where I could at that time balance both of those. I didn't have light on him. So it was the perfect opportunity to you know, do a silhouette, especially the way he's sitting. Uh, and then I'm obviously using the negative space there as well. So I'm, one of the things that I want, hopefully, that you'll take away from today is these, these fundamentals that I've touched on, is to think about and start to combine all of these in your shots. Um, because that's where you know, things can start getting really interesting. Now, there's a lot of talk about luck involved in, especially wildlife photography, because things are happening and uh, you know it's uh, it's a very dynamic subject and, and field. And I I am definitely the first to say that there, there's luck involved, but I do want to kind of emphasise on that a little bit more, and that is this is probably one of those images that, that will stay with me for quite a while. And I get asked a lot if it's a composite shot. So have I edited in the birds? Um, it looks like one bird in a series of flight. And it's not. I don't composite my images at all. Everything is, is as, as it is and how I've seen it. And I shot this sequence and I could see in, in the frame birds coming in. I didn't see them sort of perfectly spaced out like this but I saw the movement coming in and I was shooting a sequence of images. And this is one of the few times where I looked back at the, the, the screen and I kind of squealed out loud because <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. So that's where a lot of people will say, well, you know, that's where luck comes in. And yes, there's, there's a level of that. But for me, and I know this is, this is quite a common saying and I really feel like it's true, it's when preparation meets opportunity. So it comes back to where I said before about knowing your gear. So I was in a position where I knew my gear and I, had, I was ready to shoot and I was there. The opportunity is that I actually got out that day. I actually am in the position to see that happen in front of me. So that's where I feel like you, know, you need to create your own luck. You need to, especially with wildlife photography, comes back to that patience and that perseverance. You need to get out there and do it again and again and again and again and again. And uh, hopefully that's where then the passion comes around and, and keeps you motivated to keep doing it because um, certainly from my perspective, it's, it's completely worth it. So I know everyone wants to find out about equipment. <laughs> yes. Are you allowed to actually do the family? Is your work considered journalism? No, I mean, I, I could. Uh, it depends who I'm working for. So I work for, uh, so I film for National Geographic. Um, obviously, filming is a bit different um, where it is just how it is. But um, no, it's more of a personal thing that I want to I wanna display how I've seen it. Because I'm putting in the time and the effort all day, every day, I'm not going to go home and just create something that I didn't see or experience because then I don't, then I, what's the point of going out and doing it? That's kind of my perspective of it. Um, but it is a creative art form. So I certainly don't, um, I don't think that it, you know, it can't be done, but as long as it's not done in a way where it's, it's projected like it wasn't done that way. If it's an art piece and you, you're combining stuff, then, yeah, by all means, but don't pretend that it's, you know, you put in the hard hours to get out there and do it when, you know, when you're not, yeah. Yeah, but for me, I like authenticity, so I want it to be, I want to portray my images of how I see the world. And for me, that's, you'll notice in my work, it's very vibrant colour. That's how I, when I go out, that's how I see everything. It's, it's, it's intense and it's amazing and... I'm trying to project that in my work and also I'm trying to project that passion. I want my images to hopefully not only convey that passion because for me the subject is the paramount of importance. It's not, you know, I, I like the technical side of photography but it's the subject matter for me, 100%. Um, 
So that's what I'm trying to communicate. I want people to look at the images and be interested and fascinated in the animal. So I don't want to be creating a false sense of reality that actually isn't relatable anymore for people. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do much editing of the photos in your computer afterwards? Yeah, so for editing, uh, post-production I shoot raw, everything. So for those of you that work in raw, you'll know that um, you bring it in and it doesn't look like how you saw it anymore. It's basically fully scaled back, muted, and it's basically a, it's like a digital negative that has, is holding all that information, but it's not going, it's going to look like a bland version of what you physically saw. So it still needs to be worked up to, and that's where the creative side really can come in as well. So for me, I have a set, um, uh, I actually have presets that I've created in Lightroom. So whenever I import shots, I apply it on import and it's blanket to everything. And that's basically the main starting point. And for most of the time, I don't have to do anything after that. Um, but if there's situations where, you know, the white balance wasn't right or, you know, some individual images need some tweaking, then that's when I'll go in and do it. But I also need to be really efficient in my post-production because I don't have a lot of time. I'm in a lot of situations where um, power is an issue, access to power. Um, so I have to be really efficient in, you know, utilising time on the computer. Um, and also time of getting things out quickly. I have to be able to, you know, I can come back from a shoot and the way that I work is when I import all my images into Lightroom, I don't go through and go, oh, that's crappy, I'm going to get rid of that, that's crappy. I, I just go through and go, okay, I like that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. The ones that jump out to me, I will give it a star rating. Then I filter everything else out. I don't even look at the crappy stuff. I don't waste my time deleting things or doing any of that stuff. I don't have time for it. So I only focus on the stuff that I actually want to work on. So I'll do that first round of, uh, of choice and then filter out the rest. And then I'll go through and go, okay, I want to work on this one, this one, this one. Give it a, usually I just go from one to five stars. I don't even work up. I just go one, five. Okay, so five filter everything else out and then if anything else needs tweaking other than the presets that I've done. Um, and the presets for me are, um, I don't adjust sharpening, however it's imported into Lightroom, I just leave it. I don't like to, to dabble too much in that. Um, but I will add some saturation and a bit of vibrance in Lightroom. I'll add um, some con contrast, not with the contrast slider, but with the, the tonal curve, so the S curves. Same principle, you can use the contrast slider. Um, and then I especially work with um, highlights and shadows. I'll generally bring out a little bit of detail in both of those areas, which are just sliders in Lightroom as well. So really, really quite simple. Uh, and I'll also use um, lens profiles. So I'll do a correction so that any kind of um, distortion from the lens and chromatic aberration is corrected. And that's pretty much it. So I can power through really, really quickly. Yeah. So this one here is, this is the, the Tamron 150 to 600, definitely my favorite and go-to lens. Like I said, um, I can't physically carry a 600 mil around. And I, I've just come back from the Arctic where I was leading a photographic, um, a couple of back-to-back -back photographic expeditions. And, uh, you know, we've got people on there that are, they've got their lenses and they're bringing all this massive stuff. Um, and you quickly find that we, we're going from a ship climbing down into a little zodiac that's kind of splashing and kind of going around and then we're getting off onto shore and we're hiking. So a 600 mil quickly becomes really, you're really heavy. <laughs> and I'm, I'm the first to admit the 150 to 600, I can work with that all day long, but it's heavy. I mean, I, I get sore in the shoulder and the arm. Oh, sorry, that's me. <laughs> So it's, it's one of those things that you build up a fitness for it as well. You just have to kind of push through that. But I couldn't physically hold up a really large prime lens and work constantly. I would physically be shaking the whole time. And so, you know, people on my expedition, they're carrying their monopods around everywhere. And that's one of the great ways of being able to stabilize it and also rest in between when you're not shooting that you can actually just like let it go. Um, but for me, I, I work... 
I'm constantly wanting to change my composition. So I want, I want to be able to zoom in and out. I want to be able to be free. I don't work on, um, generally I don't work on tripods unless I'm filming, which is then I have to. Um, so if I'm shooting stills, I want to be able to move around freely. And so that's for me where a zoom comes in and a zoom that I can physically use all day, all day, every day. So that's, uh, and this is, this is the film camera that I use. Um, so you can see not only am I using it on my, my Nikons to shoot stills, but I do film with this lens as well. Um, so definitely, definitely my, my favorite. Uh, and uh, so again, that's, you know, it looks quite big, but it's shot with a wide angle lens as well. So there is some examples up the back. So once we're done, you're most welcome to go and actually, you know, you can feel the weight of it as well. And yep, it might feel heavy, but uh, like I said, you, it's something you can build up to as well. Um, and it's definitely a lot lighter than, you know, uh, a lot of the, the stuff that you're going to get an actual 600 mil focal length at. Um, the other lens that I like working at, and I'll touch on this soon, is the 15 to 30 mil. It's not really a focal length that you kind of think of when, when you think of wildlife. Um, it can be easy to immediately go for the, the long telephoto lenses, but actually having a variety of focal lengths can, is where you can really start to get interesting with your work. So I'm gonna to touch on the four favorite lenses that I use on you know, a daily basis. Uh, the 150 to 600 is absolute daily. Um, and then I use the 70 to 200, which is also a really nice focal length. Um, and then I have a 90 mil macro that I use. That's not one that I use like every day, um, but it's definitely giving some really nice results and it then allows me to go very close into a subject if it's something that I can safely approach. And then, like I said, the 15 to 30, where I can do some really nice environmental portraits if I can get close into that animal. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, protection for lenses in the environments. I I have rain covers, so if I'm in a situation where there's a lot of condensation, um, so in the Arctic, for example, if I'm going out on the zodiac and it's it's very choppy and I know there's it's you know there's a lot of water splashing up, I'm going to put my full rain cover on. Um, so that gives me complete protection because I can then just put my hands up through and, and utilize it that way. Uh, in terms of on the, the lens physically, um, you know, I don't actually work with filters that much. I sometimes have a UV lens on more as a protection as opposed to the effect. I don't, um, you know, polarizers are quite handy. I can't really work with any, any, anything that's graduated because I don't have time to be, you know, landscape photography is perfect because you want, you know, you can level it and place it and have it, uh, you know, underexposing your sky and then, you know, balancing out your foreground. But in wildlife, I'm constantly going vertical landscape, you know, running around and so I don't have time to be adjusting filters like that. So usually a UV filter and, uh, and a rain jacket is kind of the only thing. The beauty of the, the new generation two of the Tamron lenses is they're, they're weather sealed. So much better in terms of if it starts raining a little bit outside, it's fine, I don't, I don't worry about that. If it's a downpour, then I'm gonna get my, my rain jacket for sure. Yeah. I do, yeah. So I shoot for stills. I have uh, the Nikon D800 and a D800E. Um, and the only difference between those two is um, the E doesn't have the low pass filter. And what that means is most cameras have a low pass filter, so it blurs out and then resharpens your image to help counter uh, what's called moray patterns. And that's found in, in shirts. So for example, striped shirts or patterns in um, fabrics and that kind of thing, mostly man-made situations. So when it comes to wildlife photography, you're not finding those in nature. Um, so the D800E is exceptionally sharp. It's amazing. If I could have two, I would, but I don't. <laughs> I just have the first one and the next one. So um, yeah, going on to the E was a, a, a noticeable difference in sharpness for me. So um, definitely one I recommend. If you're, you know, if you're then swapping between people and that kind of thing, you're going to find a bit of a, 
an issue with that, so something to be aware of. But if it's just wildlife and nature, amazing, yeah. Yeah, and both, they're identical cameras other than that. So the beauty is when I'm working with two cameras, everything's in the same place. I don't have to think about because I'll be shooting and I will change, be changing things as I go while I'm shooting. I, you know, don't have time to look down um, or be thinking what, cam what body am I using. So it's really nice that I can have, you know, two of the same thing. So, um, yeah, so this one... I'm going to go through some, some favorite images of mine and take you through what lens and, and some settings that I shot them at. One thing I want to emphasize, um, you know, we can be very focused on, I want to see what the settings were, I want to see what the aperture and the shutter and the ISO was. But I just want to remind people that that is only really relevant. It's, it's a nice way of reverse engineering images to get an understanding of, of how settings work but it doesn't give you the full picture. It's not giving you an understanding of the light situation or the creative decisions of the photographer at the time. So they're things that you, you need to kind of consider as well because you could get, for the same exposure, to get a perfectly exposed image, I could use a combination of completely different settings and still get the correct exposure. It's gonna give me a different look and feel. So there are creative decisions that are also being made that, um, that's something that you need to consider as well. But it's, it's a, a good way for you to see how, um, you know, in general, how I, how I work. So again, the 150 to 600, this time fully extended at 600. And so that means the absolute lowest aperture that I can use on this lens at 600, because it's not a fixed aperture, is 6.3. And that's the reason that I'm at 6.3, because I'm having my aperture as the absolute lowest that I can possibly have at all times. That's just a creative decision for me. That's how I like to shoot, unless I specifically have subjects where I've got multiple subjects that I want to keep in focus and I would then want to work with a, you know, more depth of field, then I might start going up to, to f8 or something like that. Um, and even there's one shot where I'm shooting wide, uh, wide where I specifically want more of the background in, in focus. So I'm shooting, I think I went up to 11 or f16, it's coming up, but um, that's quite rare for me. When shooting stills, most of the time it's autofocus, yeah. If I'm filming, it's always manual. But um, yeah, if uh, for the stills most of the time, unless it's a really tricky situation where the, the camera just cannot find focus where I want it to, it might be low light or there just might be too much, you know, in front of it, for example, then I'll switch to manual and, and go from there. But for the most part, I'm going to utilise uh, the technology that I've got access to and it's going to be quicker than, than me generally yeah so yeah this one um, you can see ISO is 320 so I like to keep it native which on the D800 I'm pretty sure is ISO 200 it could be 100 but around that area so if that's starting to pick up I know I can safely go to about 800 on this camera and have an absolutely beautiful usable shot. I've gone well past that and have been really impressed with the results. Um, but for the most part, I try to keep it as low as I can. So you can see this is a situation where I could have easily gone with a higher shutter speed and gone with a higher ISO to compensate. Um, but I've just tried to find that balance and it's been able to give me you know, the sharpness to freeze that moment, but I've still then got some nice movement in the water as well. Not a decision that I made at the time, but just a nice byproduct of the settings that I used at the time. So ah, F11. So this is an example of using the, the 15 to 30 for wildlife. I mean, if you've got subjects that you can actually get close to. So this is quite an iconic area called Baobab Alley in Madagascar. So for me to see this chameleon, which is a, a giant Malagasy chameleon, um, so it's very large, and actually a few pictures before when I um, had pictures of myself with gear, I had it here on my shoulder so you could see for scale it was very large. Um, so when I see this walking along in this kind of setting, I could definitely go for my 70 to 200. I know I can get pretty close to this animal, so you know I could pretty much go for any focal length 
do some nice tight shots if I wanted to. But the whole point of interest is that the fact that it was here, it was in this location. So that's where I wanted to actually show a sense of environment. Um, so I've tried to incorporate, you know, as much of that environment into it as I can. Um, so yeah, don't sort of get stuck on that wildlife has to be telephoto only. Um, if you can safely do it, there's some really nice opportunities to do more environmental stuff. Yeah, sometimes I use remote cameras. Um, probably the prime example was my Komodo dragon shot um, that I had up earlier where I've, uh, I'm still physically touching it, uh, but I, I had it on the boom pole and some wheels and I just wheeled it in. So I was still very much moving around and controlling my angles, but I had, uh, I was able to then work with a safe distance with these dragons. So, and then I had a, a remote trigger on it and I was just triggering it um, as I wanted to take the shots. I couldn't see what I was shooting at that time. So there are definitely ways that you can do that. And I, I don't utilize that too much, um, but it's something that I'm gonna do more with filming in the future is that I can have my film camera set up and I can be a little bit further away, maybe in a hide and have my screen and adjust my settings and film and, and that kind of thing um, and not disturb the animal. Um, so with my Komodo dragon shots, I was literally just kind of shooting as I, um, you know, as I thought would be good, um, but I couldn't really see what I was doing. So, whereas this, uh, I'm laying on the ground as usual, um, in the dirt, getting as low as I possibly can. Uh, speed lights, not very often, but I do. Um, there, are, there are two instances of images that I can actually show where I utilize speed lights. Um, I've done a lot of studio work with animals, um, but that's where I'll go full blown, you know, white backgrounds and studio, completely different situation. If I'm out shooting in the wild, generally I prefer not to use flash if I can help it, um, unless it's really lending creatively to to the image so there are, are two situations of images i can show where one that i've had um, an sb 800 on the the camera in the hot shoe um, and i've combined it with a slow shutter speed and then i've uh, used a wide angle lens and twisted the barrel as i've shot to give uh, like a zoom effect in the ambient and that flash froze the foreground for me so that it's a very interesting technique, actually. I'll, I'll bring up that image in a second. Uh, and then the other time that I can show you an example of is I've shot a chameleon as well. I love lizards so much. Uh, there's a lot of chameleon shots. Um, so I've got it on a branch and I'm shooting it backlit and I actually have the sun in shot, sunburst coming out. Um, I've specifically shot at a higher aperture so that I had the lines of the sun really coming through. But that meant that if I was gonna get any kind of color in the sky, like actually any color and detail of the blue and some clouds, then you know my foreground of the chameleon was actually gonna be quite dark. So I've used some fill flash in to bring that up. It's not one of those images that you look at and you think that flash has been used, um, but it was definitely a nice way of balancing it out. But to be honest, I don't, I don't even carry flashes with me in a few years. So it's probably something that I, I could dabble with a bit more, but generally I, I stay away from it, yeah. But um, what I will do is I'll quickly bring up those images while we're talking about it so it's relevant. Um, okay. All right, so that's the image where I've used fill flash in front so that I could actually get some color and not completely have everything. So all of this would have been way too dark without the flash combined. Um, or if I exposed for this area, then I wouldn't have any color left in the sun, uh, the sky there. So that's one example that I've, I've used it in. Um, and then this is the example where I'm combining the flash and then uh, a slow shutter. So I've used 1 40th of a second here. Um, I've got a wide angle lens on. The great thing was this macaque is quite curious. So he's really coming in and looking at his reflection in the glass and, uh, and was 
excellent too because it gave me a few opportunities to do this shot. So I took maybe like 10 different goes at it and I think this was, this was the only one that I really kind of liked that I felt like it worked um, and it was maybe shot three or four or something like that. So like I've said, what I've done is slow shutter speed. Everything um, that the flash hits initially is frozen so that's nice and crisp and sharp and then everything as I press I twist the barrel so it takes a little bit of practice just keep doing it a few times um, everything else that is affected by the ambient light is then going to blur with that 1 40th of a second and give you that uh, that look and you can do it coming back or going forward it gives you uh, some really interesting effects so yeah Alrighty. So this um, this image is surprisingly with the 70 to 200. Um, this bear was very very close. Um, so I've got it fully extended at 200, and I haven't cropped the image either. I generally don't crop that often afterwards. Um, I'm very conscious of trying to get things composed in camera. Um, so this situation, I was actually on a on a ship on an icebreaker. And so if I'd, have, if I'd have shot over the edge of the ship, I would have actually been looking down at the bear. This bear was very, very curious, came up to the ship, physically put its paws on the side and looked up, um, basically trying to work out how it could get on so it could eat us because we smelled really <laughs> great. Um, thankfully, it couldn't get up that high. Um, but actually what it had done is, as the icebreaker had kind of pushed through, we'd pushed through some ice and we'd got to a point where we couldn't go any further and we're up, right up close to the, to the North Pole. I think we're like 82, 83 degrees, I don't know. Um, so we're at a stop, at a standstill, and that meant that there was quite some thick ice that had pushed up against the ship and it allowed for the bear to get up even higher. So this guy's come in and uh, he's kind of spending a bit, fair bit of time looking around and he physically stood up on his back legs and like was trying to get as high as possible. So what I've done is with the ship, because I want to get as low as I can, the lowest I can get on this ship is obviously laying on the deck. And so every now and then there's like holes in the side. So obviously if water comes over, it can flush out or they can feed ropes through. So I've laid on, on the deck and I've shot through this little hole which is maybe like this long, open. And this bear literally just came up and we were just eye to eye at this point uh, and very, very close. And I've got a couple of shots there and then I've got some other shots where he's looking up and you can see it's almost like a dog. His nose is like this way, then this way and he's just smelling and trying to find the direction of, of what he's trying to do. So. One of the benefits of working in the Arctic is, well, in summertime anyway, is 24-hour sunlight. So your light is kind of, you know, depending on the weather, it's always perfect. So I have no idea what time of day this was. Um, but you can see there I've got one thousandth of a second. He wasn't, you know, running around at high speed. You know, I could have gone much lower than that and still got a sharp shot. Um, but you can see my ISO there is nice and low. So for me, the primary focus was that I wanted the look and feel to be F4, so it all starts to fade away, background starts to go out of focus. I've got my ISO nice and low, as low as I want to go. And then um, in this situation, I'm shooting in aperture priority mode from memory, so I let the shutter speed, whatever it needs to be, to give me the exposure that I want. So, yeah. Also in the Arctic, same lens, this time not fully extended um, at 165 mil. And uh, again, F4, um, yeah, 500th of a second, ISO 250. So you can see there my ISO is starting to go up, so my shutter is starting to come down, and that's where I'm finding the balance in. So I'm always making a set decision with aperture, and I'm finding a balance between shutter and ISO to get the, uh, the exposure that I want. Again, 150 to 600 and fully extended at 600. So, um, you know, I know some people might have questions about a zoom and utilizing it fully extended and its sharpness. Um, that's where I feel like hopefully these images can give you an example. This, I'm super happy with the, this lens and I utilize six, fully extended at 600 mil all the time. I mean, I'm in situations where 
Um, sometimes I can get close, but there are a lot of times where I want to get closer and 600 is, is what's going to do it for me. So I'm not shy about utilizing the full length of that lens. Um, and you can see there, I'm tr I know he's doing these thrashing movements. So I'm not really wanting to go below 400th of a second at this point. So that's where I'm starting to push my ISO up to 640. So starting to get to the higher end there. Um, so that I can still, you know, freeze that mo uh, that movement. And this, you can tell, obviously, it's at uh, it's starting to get at dusk. Um, so I've got the sun is behind me, and it's actually hitting this bank behind. So by me getting as low as I possibly could again, I would have liked to have been able to get lower. But where I was physically, which was on the bank on the other side, I like I literally couldn't. I could dig a hole, and I still couldn't get really any lower than this because for me, I would have loved to have gone like level with the water even more and lowered this background line so that we're, you know, really getting like way more there. But, you know, you utilize the situation as best you can. And um, I think that light, you know, and the coloring works really nicely. And then we still had some blue light overhead. So you can see that's where it's hitting the top of him and, and that uh, water around him. And the orange-blue uh, combination is really quite nice. You'll notice that they utilize that combo, color combo in cinema quite a lot, um, uh, purposefully. So an example of the 90mm macro. Um, like I said, I don't utilize it on a daily basis as much, but this is in Madagascar, and I'm, I'm heading back to Madagascar in October, and it's one that I'm going to have with me constantly. And that's because... You know, the beauty of Madagascar is you can go around on foot a lot, you can get really close to stuff. You're running into lots of different insects and reptiles that you can get in very close proximity to. Small subjects where the macro comes in really handy. But then the, the wildlife there, and especially all the different lima species, they, they're very, very curious. It's like they lack this natural fear of man so they actually will come into you quite often um, and you would have seen earlier the picture where I actually have one landing on my head because it's jumped from a tree I'm standing there I'm actually in the line of where it wants to go so I'm like a perfect pole just to jump on like it's it's incredible um, so the macro really comes in handy uh, here and that will give you a really good example too so I can get really close I'm not then limited by having a minimum focus distance of another lens where I have to stand back, back, back. You know, I can then utilize that macro. Um, and you should be able to see there, you can see my reflection there with the macro lens shooting in its face. <laughs> so very, very close. Another example of the 150 to 600, and um, uh, I included this one specifically to highlight the, the really nice bokeh that you can get with this lens. Um, again, I'm fully uh, extended at 600, and so I've got the aperture at 6.3 because it's the lowest that I can physically do with that lens. Um, and it's, it's maybe, you know, this may be not the result that you actually equate with f6.3. So that's what I really like about it. Once you combine it with 600 mils and the compression that comes with that, the other things that come into play, obviously, is your proximity to the subject, so where you're focusing, and the subject's proximity to the background. That's going to determine how out of focus and, you know, the kind of, you know, creamy blur that you get and, and how that looks in the background. And again, with practice, that's the kind of thing that then you can start to anticipate and you know. Um, so yeah, really, really, this is very quintessential of the kind of look that I like where I you know, even that could potentially be a busy background. If I shot it with, um, you know, I wasn't fully extended at 600 or I was at a higher aperture, it's going to be a really busy image. So it's, you know, it's too much grass happening and it's not really complementing the subject matter anymore. Whereas this, it's kind of working, you know, to, to complement and to help separate out. And I think this might be my last image. Um, this one, I've come right back, and that's purely as a, comp uh, a composition decision. I've done quite a few images of this leopard. It was jumping up and coming down, so I've got some at 600. Um, this one, I'm almost fully back, and that's so that I can get some of that tree line in and give a bit of a sense of place. Now, 
one thing you'll notice is that ISO is really high and that's because the sun is completely gone. We've got that pastel, beautiful hour of, uh, of dusk. So the sunset was actually behind me and that's why I'm getting still a little bit of light coming onto the leopard, some nice golden light and then everything behind is just pastel. So 4500 is very high for an ISO. I usually wouldn't push it that far. Um, but I didn't want to go below 500th of a second in this case because she was moving around quite a lot. So that's uh, so you get an understanding of where my decisions come into play there. Um, she was stopped here for a second. Um, you know, so technically I probably could have lowered my shutter and then lowered my ISO. But one of the things with wildlife photography is it's constantly changing and constantly dynamic. So that means then I risk uh, getting a blurry image when I didn't want to the next time she jumps. So I don't know if for me, maybe on this screen, but in general, that ISO is, is not an issue. I think it still comes across quite nicely. Um, the Nikon does a pretty good job of... Um, of doing that. Like I said, I generally try not to go over 800, but I will if I have to. Yeah? Just composition-wise, I noticed that she's in the center here. Yes. And I was asking why you chose to put it in the center rather than yeah. the right. Yeah, um, I took a couple of that way as well. Uh, so my composition decision for this one was to give uh, an equal sense of the tree branching over her. So that's why I've put her in the bottom. So while she is in the middle there, she's not in the middle here, which is you'll, I'll generally avoid um, unless I'm getting like a really nice reflection or like there's a really good symmetrical reason for it. Um, but working off center, then it's, you know, whether I'm putting it, you know, over here and she's looking into frame. The thing is this tree wasn't that big, so it kind of, filters out here and here. So I did some shots like that where it's looking out, but then the tree kind of finishes. And I wanted to give one where she had a full canopy above her. So I did take some like that, and I've got a whole series of, of different compositions. Yeah. Do you shoot totally manually, or do you do anything some, like photo, ISO, or? Sometimes. Or yeah, so sometimes, uh, maybe like 70% I'll shoot manual. Uh, and otherwise it'll be aperture priority, yeah. So every now and then um, I might dabble in the, the auto ISO, but generally I know I wanna keep it um, low. The beauty of, of the camera that I'm using is I can set parameters. So if I set ISO auto, I can then tell it to, you know, it doesn't start pushing it up unless my shutter speed goes below a certain amount. Um, so that's really handy because then I know it will only start compromising on that area. You know, I often have that set to 400th of a second or 500th of a second because I know I don't want to go, in most situations with, with moving subjects, I don't want to go below that. So then I'm allowing it to then start upping it as need be. Depends on the situation and how dynamic it is and how much time I feel like I'm going to have to actually adjust things. Um, but generally, for the most part, these days, I used to work almost exclusively in aperture priority mode. And, um, and I've done a lot of, even a lot of my best work in it. It's a really, really excellent way of shooting um, wildlife, especially because I can be shooting this way into the sun with an animal and shoot it as it runs and then pass and all of a sudden um, away from the sun and you've got completely different exposure. Uh, and if, you know, in those situations, if I'm, if I'm shooting manual, then I'm compromising on one. So maybe I've got it set and it's fine and this, and then I'm missing these shots over here because my exposure is completely out now. So that's where aperture priority mode is really, really excellent for, yeah, for moving subjects that, you know, lighting situations are constantly changing. I assume the lenses have image stabilization. Do you use it? Yes. And does it degrade the image? Always. No. Um, image stabilization, I... Um, not that I'm aware of that it has any degradation on the on the image. Um, I use it all the time because I'm obviously if I'm filming I don't. If I'm on a tripod, you need to turn that off because otherwise you're going to wonder why you're on a tripod and you're not getting sharp shots. <laughs> it's trying to compensate for you. Um, but yes, always have image stabilization on and utilized. Um, and one of the really interesting things actually about the 
15 to 30 is it was one of the first I think the first wide angle lens to have image stabilization built into the lens it's actually a really you'll see it up the back there it's a very solid kind of decent sized lens um, so yeah I'll always have that turned on because I'm always shooting handheld if it stills I'm pretty much guaranteed to be handheld yeah I'm trying to build up the guns <laughs> it's not working <laughs> all right so yes a little off-topic question. Sure. But uh, people that are in your business, mm. uh, wildlife filmmakers, you know the old adage of uh, let nature take, take its course. Uh, what, what are the, uh, I, I'm sure the, uh, the uh, parks in the protocols that you can, can't do, but ethically and morally, uh, how do you feel about certain things? I mean, some of these species are so rare. I don't know, the cheetah cubs and, and Bush, the mother's hunting, and their hyenas approaching. You wait to get the shot of the kill, or would you uh, scare away the hyenas? What, um, I know what you might be not allowed to do, but um, what would you want to do? And, well, <laughs> I would want to save the, the cheetah cub, but I also have to think that that hyena may have a cub or a pup as well that it's trying to feed. In those situations, and, it, and it's funny that you bring up a cheetah because they are critically endangered and they have a lot of issues with uh, genetics and reproduction and needing assistance in that area. Um, however, in a situation like that, um, yeah, I would have to leave it be. If it was a different situation where those cubs, the mother had been killed, for example, and those cubs had no one caring for them and they were just left out to the elements, I, I would do my best to try and get them into care, yeah, so that they could be raised. Kind of off course, really. It's not like 50 years ago where it happened. There's so many other influences that... Yeah, there are. And, you know, the funny thing is there are a lot of people that are very much purists in that, you know, you have to absolutely leave everything be. But the reality is the human influence on wildlife is already there. We've already made the impact and a lot of the situations, and actually most of the situations that they're in are because of people. The you know, purists? they're endangered because of us. Yeah, it's a small industry. Um, and most of the people in this industry, because it is a very, it's a very tough, industry especially to make a living in so we're not in it for the money at all um, and we're not in it for the glamour or the short working hours or any of the luxuries we're in it for the passion and we're in it for the passion of the wildlife that's really the only reason because um, you know you've definitely got the passion of photography and gear and filming um, but you could apply that to any subject. So you probably, you know, if you didn't have a passion for wildlife, you're not going to go through the trouble of, of doing that unless you really love it. So I think that then comes with the innate, um, you know, wanting to care for and protect these animals. And certainly the photographers and filmmakers that I know, um, you know, most of us, if not all of us, are working towards some sort of, um, awareness for wildlife conservation and preservation that's really because you know we're there on the ground every day so we're seeing actually the really horrific stuff that's happening and you can't get to a point where you know you can get into this industry because you know for selfish reasons you love animals and you want to take pictures and you know it's really rewarding but then it quickly becomes a bit bigger than that you know you can't get to a point where you're doing that and separate yourself from um, the the threats that are facing wildlife so I think you know we're all pretty pretty passionate about it we want to protect them but we're also very aware of trying not to interfere into situations that should be allowed to run their course if it was very much human related so for example there's often young elephant babies getting trapped in wells human made wells um, where the mother physically can't get them out so of course you know people are coming in and they're trying to bring them out they're trying to do it in a time sensitive fashion so that it can go back to the mother if at that point the mother's gone or rejected that baby then it goes into care we're not in a position where we have the luxury of 
not doing anything because you know these animals are so critically endangered now. Not that they didn't matter before because they absolutely did and unfortunately we you know as people get to a point where we have to lose something before we really value it um, but it's really paramount now where every single life matters for the for the future of the species yeah so for, you know it's it's tough like I can film I'll be filming sequences where it is natural that an animal is predated on and I'm not filming it because I en enjoy that. I'm, it's very difficult emotionally, um, but that is part of nature and I'm there to document nature. So, you know, assuming that hasn't been set up where it's not, you know, it's been manipulated by people and it's not actually nature, I would, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. But if it is nature, then I need to, then I have to get into a mode where I'm focused on I'm getting the shot and I'm, I'm feeling for that animal, but I need to, yeah. You can't be the person that's yelling out and scaring off animals because that has a flow on effect for that animal as well. Um, and that's actually really unethical behavior also is, you know, you think you're doing one thing. I mean, everyone has a lot of sympathy for the prey animals, but there's prey animals and there's predators and there's balance for a reason. And that's why there are always a lot more prey animals and there are fewer predators. And that's, you know, that's how nature is designed. Um, it doesn't mean it's easy, but that's the way it is. And I always have to think of, you know, that lion, you know, has a baby, that, that lion has to survive so that, you know, nature is in balance as well. But it's, it's tough, yeah. I just went on for a really long time. <laughs> I could just go on and on and on about wildlife and conservation, so, yeah. Um, so from a, yeah. Yes, um, in for, well, for a few species, for elephant and rhino, especially, poaching um, and human encroachment, so loss of habitat. Um, but yeah, poaching is, is really the, the number one thing. Um, and there's starting to be more awareness, not just about, because there's been a lot of publicity about rhino and elephant poaching especially in recent years, um, which is really excellent. There are still a lot of animals that are, that are critically endangered and that poaching is a real issue that people haven't even heard of yet. Um, and one of those that is starting to come out in the media a lot more that people will start to then recognize uh, is the pangolin. And I haven't had, a, haven't had the benefit of seeing one in the wild yet. Um, I know field guides that work out in the bush every day for 20 years and they've never seen one um, and it's actually a so I don't even have a picture to show you because I've never seen one um, but it's basically a scaled mammal it looks a little bit like an armadillo um, and it's an anteater so completely harmless so really easy for people to poach because they literally can just walk up to it pick it up and go and it's 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 the most trafficked animal in the world hands down and nobody knows Nobody knows about it, nobody knows what it is. It's called a pangolin. Yeah, they're beautiful. And as a reptile lover, it's like, it's fully covered in these massive scales, kind of looks like a, a, a reptile, but it's a mammal. Um, and it's quite long, it has this sort of big kind of flap of a tail, and if it gets uh, scared, it rolls up into a tight ball. So then it's just in an armor of scales. So it's poached for its scales. Yep, same as, yeah, same as, uh, so rhinos are poached for their horn because it's believed that there's medicinal value when actually it's just uh, keratin, it's like fingernail and hair, it's just condensed. Um, so no medicinal value. And then for elephant, obviously, it's the ivory. Um, and there's actually still this perception that, um, you know, ivory, that's it's used in ornaments and carvings and it's highly prized and it's very much a status symbol. Um, there's actually still cultures that believe that the animals shed those naturally when that does not happen. So if you have a piece of ivory, that animal has been slaughtered to get that piece. And brutally, usually, because these people do not care about the welfare of that animal. They are, you know, I don't even want to get into it. <laughs> yeah. Why 
I I do. I use a variety. So I have all different lenses, and I'll I'll use whatever I feel is you know working for me at the time. So I've got all different brands. Yeah. So I'm not. Um, you know, I'll use I'll use the lens that's going to do the best job, and that I feel like is doing the best job for me. Yeah. Good. Obviously. I was getting to the point where it's supposed to be fun. You know, wildlife photography, like I'm, I keep going back to passion and that's really because you're, you're going to choose a subject surely if that's what you're interested in because you like it. So don't forget to enjoy the moments. Don't forget to go out there and actually take a moment to look at what you're doing and enjoy it. And yes, it can be, it can be frustrating and you're really pushing on your patience. Um, but just go back to that, that it's actually a privilege to be in the presence of these animals and um, that it is supposed to be fun. That you need to get out there and physically do it over and over again and that's where you're really going to learn. And you can, you know, I'm, I'm a self-taught photographer, so for me it's the getting out there and actually playing with my camera and doing it over and over again that I actually get to those moments where I have the aha moment and, and you know, something will click and then um, a few things will fall into place. So I might have read about it, you know, something specific or something technical, and you know, I've kind of understood it, and then I've gone out into the field and you know, practice, 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 and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I've got it. And then you, know, you move on to the next thing. So definitely really important to get out there and just shoot. Shoot a ton because you can, you know, if it's not great, you delete it, you learn from it. And the beauty of digital is that you can look and get immediate feedback. So if you start changing settings and don't kind of, if you're not 100% sure of what everything is doing, don't start going crazy. Change one thing at a time, take a picture, see what the result is, learn from that. And then you'll start to realize, you know, which parts are affecting what and how everything integrates together. Um, and there are so many more technical things that I, I could go on about, but um, obviously, we don't have, have the time today. So I want to mention that I have an ebook on my website um, that I'll, I'll give you a look here. So basically, um, I can go into a lot more detail about not only um, the, the photography fundamentals and, and the technical side of things, but also equipment choice. Uh, and also I go into my post-production. So I take you step by step with the screen grabs of Lightroom from when I import the RAW and everything that I do until the final output of the image. Um, so yeah, it's 60 pages, it's like five bucks, it's nothing. So definitely worthwhile if, uh, if it's something that you wanna look into more. Uh, so the website, it's pretty simple, shannonwild.com, that's it. Uh, and I've got the the little shop link here. So that's where you're going to find my ebook. And then if you go over to here, all my expeditions and events. So I do run photographic expeditions, uh, Madagascar, Arctic uh, are the main ones at the moment. I'll be incorporating a few more locations soon. So if that's something that you're interested in, then keep an eye on that because I update it. Um, and it also has any speaking engagements like this that, I, that I'm doing around the place. So definitely worthwhile checking out. And then I wanted to touch on a new venture. Yay, I can see you're wearing them. Awesome. Um, a few months ago, I started a jewelry line and that's to raise money for wildlife conservation. And uh, who I'm raising money for at the moment is uh, an organization called Wild Tomorrow Fund and have Wendy up the back there. It's New York based, founded, uh, but they actually do some really amazing work in South Africa where I am based. Um, and so they're very focused on land acquisition, which is one of those critical parts. You know, you can rehabilitate, you can save animals, but if you've got nowhere to actually put them back, it's kind of pointless. So they do some really amazing work with protecting habitats and working with anti-poaching units and, and biologists and all sorts of things. So um, that's where proceeds are, are going from the sales of these at the moment. Um, so yeah, also on the shop link on my website, it's all online. Um, so if that's something that you're into, then by all means. 
Um, and then finally, if you want to follow where I happen to be at the time and, and my work, I post most often on Instagram, um, and I try to I try to post a lot if I can. Wi-Fi is a bit of a luxury for me, so I will you know depending on where I am, I'll do it as often as I as I can. Um, and then, for example, I've just come back uh, from the Arctic and then um, Borneo and in Indonesia in general where I haven't had Wi-Fi access for quite a long time, basically since June-ish. So I now have like a ton of pictures that I'm going to start. So I'm going to start posting a lot more Arctic pictures. So even though I'm not there anymore, it's because I haven't been able to at the time. Um, but generally, it's, it's pretty up to date. And the other thing that I do is whenever I post an image, I always tell you the settings. I'll tell you the camera, the lens, the aperture, the ISO, and the shutter speed so that you can have an idea of how, how I'm shooting. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Any advice for like traveling gear? Oh, good question. Uh, traveling gear is, is is the bane of my existence, basically. Um, I I can I haven't used the lens yet, but I know Tamara have just come out with an eighteen to four hundred, so that'll be quite nice because you get a low range. Um, I, wear, I, I try to travel as light as I possibly can. Um, generally, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, but if I'm, it depends on the subject. But generally, air travel, I'm trying to keep my camera bodies and my lenses physically with me. I don't check stuff in if I can help it. I do ca uh, travel with some bigger equipment, tripods and um, you know filming equipment. I'll keep the camera physically with me, check in always. I will argue it to the to the end um, because I'm not letting that out of my sight. Uh, but then everything else kind of has to compromise. So every now and then, with luggage weights and that kind of thing, I'm having to like wrap lenses in like a lot of clothes and kind of put them in checked. Um, but for the most part, I try to keep everything on me. And then oversize, um, you know, bigger equipment. I'll have to. But yeah, yeah. I think if you if you really need to try to travel light, then it just gets to a point where you have to commit to set lenses or you know set lens choices that you think are best, and not dwell on what you don't have with you anymore, and just actually, you know, commit to that. So if that's like a 70 to 200, and that's all you take, or that and a wide, or you want like a teleconverter, that's also where zooms come in really handy too. While like working with zooms. So I get a lot of variety with, um, you know, not having to have, you know, I can generally travel with like four to six lenses and feel like I'm pretty covered. Mm. That, and that's a lot. So you can easily do it with one or two, depending on what your subject matter is. Yeah. I think that's uh, pretty much on time, yeah. I'm looking at my watch that doesn't exist, so. <laughs> Never wear a watch. Thank you.